Hey guys, it's Jake Mace, vegan athlete in the backyard. As you guys can see, my Moringa trees behind me that I pruned back about a month ago are coming back with a vengeance. The Moringa are their own animal. The Moringa trees can grow so fiercely that I'm gonna cut them all down completely to my height. And what I've noticed is that that way, the canopy is encouraged to start at head height and it creates a lot more leaves, a lot more flowers, a lot more of the drumsticks, the pods and just creates a tree that can weather the wind and the storms much, much better. in just about a month. It's putting off easily a foot of growth or more, a foot and a half maybe on each branch. And very shortly, as the temperatures get warmer in the Phoenix area, these guys will become 12, 15 feet tall and I'll have to cut them back so they don't shade out my solar panels, but leave them bushy and big so they'll shade my house and keep it cooler and drop my AC bill down in the summertime because that's the most expensive bill we have is during the summertime for the air conditioner in Phoenix. Give me a thumbs up for the new seed bank box shirt. I'm kind of excited about this. It's a nice little design there. I want to give you guys a brief update of how my glass gem corn is growing from the seed bank box. But first, there's a fruit tree in my garden I planted two years ago. It was from Seamus O'Leary's Tropical Fruit Trees. And he gave it to me for $15 because it was a tree that was lost in the corner of the yard. It was about this tall. It wasn't even strong enough to hold itself up. When I planted it, the branches just fell on the ground. It looked like a vine, even though it was a tree. It was not a vine. I had to take three stakes just to stand it upright because Seamus has a lot of trees, and this one was like the Charlie Brown Christmas tree that was forgotten about in the corner of the yard. So I got it, planted it. Hey, it's Jake Mace, the vegan athlete. I wanted to show you guys something I just planted. Two years later, here's what it looks like now. I mean, the size of it, the shape of it, it looks perfect. This is a female fruiting mulberry. It does not put any pollen, making people's allergies worse. It only produces fruit. And look at how they're starting to grow. All the fruits here are starting to transition from green to red. And in a couple weeks from now, when they turn twice as fat and they turn purple, I will eat them in front of you guys and show you. I mean, easily, the tree is 15 feet tall, probably 12 feet wide. And you know what? I see a ripe fruit up there. Let me knock it down and I'll eat it for you guys right now. This is the first, the first mulberry of the season. I'm pretty excited about that. This means that for a month, my skin on my hands will be stained purple. Let's taste it and see how it tastes. Oh, I forgot to share with the camera lady. <laughs> Blasphemy. Oh, it's fantastic. It's so good. I'll get the camera lady one in a second. So good. This one's called a Peruvian, and I find it's the biggest tree with the most abundant source of fruit. My favorite mulberry is the Pakistani. People also like the Everbearing and the Shangri-La, but I like the Pakistani because they're long. It tastes like syrup. This one is fantastic. Tastes like a sweet blackberry, and it's the one that I can fill my entire freezer with. Next to this tree is this female fruiting date palm that I planted in front of you guys that I picked up from the amazing family in Death Valley at the China Date Ranch. Now we're gonna bring him over and put him in the hole. And that looks pretty good to me. And this one's called a China Ranch Gold. And it's the first date palm in my yard that's actually fruiting. 
and flowering. Look at the flowers. That's what female date flowers look like. And this is the first time this tree's ever flowered before. So in the next day or so, when these flowers open, I'll be puffing a little smoke of male pollen that I have inside. And I mean, we probably should knock the flowers off to encourage growth, but I wanna see if she produces dates this year. So China Ranch Gold, pretty cool that of the 24 female fruiting date palms I have here on my property, that's the first one to flower because I'm still in the infant stages of my urban uh, date tree oasis. Come on over here. As we're making our way back to the glass gem corn for the seed bank box crowd, I want to show you what's growing inside my river. This is really cool. These are different colors of irises that grow in my river. This one's a yellow iris and they bloom every spring. This one over here is a purple iris and I think that it's breathtaking. And it uses the fish poop that's in the water as its nutrients. So really fantastic. Okay, you guys saw me plant this garden out. It's a brand new raised bed, brand new soil. So of course, it's gonna be the hardest to grow in this soil of all time because it's brand new. Every season that I continue to grow plants in this garden, the soil will get more and more alive and be easier and easier to have a successful garden in. But for now, it's brand new. Look at all my glass gem corn. It sprouted, every kernel sprouted. We had a really high germination rate of the glass gem corn that was inside the March seed bank box. I can't wait to show you guys what's gonna be inside April's seed bank box. It'll be the best box yet. And I'm gonna just uh, take my pruners here and go through these corns and pick the one that's less worthy. So see these two, these three stalks of corn here? Obviously this one right here looks to be the biggest and the strongest. So even though they're all my babies and it's tough to do, we have to trim back the lesser ones in order to give more strength to the one that remains. I don't pull the roots out because I want the roots to, to biodegrade back into the soil. So I just leave these guys right here as mulch and I'm gonna just go through and cut the less worthy corn stalks away and that way, the one that's left over will be more vigorous in the months coming up. Sometimes they're even, like these two, and they both look good. And when that's the case, you gotta just make a judgment call. Did I pick the right one or not? <laughs> I hope so. The springtime garden always looks so good. Everything's starting to grow again. My pecan tree is the last tree to bud out for the spring and it's finally starting to grow. If you guys look over here, in my martial arts section, we had this blood orange tree that was a baby last year and is growing really well. All this new growth looking really nice. And behind the blood orange tree is this passion fruit. And this is a Frederick passion fruit. They also call it a passion flora edulis. And this passion fruit was planted by me and Greeny's Garden about a year and a half ago. And it's now starting to grow really vigorously. I gave it a temporary trellis so it could reach the top of my seven foot tall wall here. This wall is seven feet as per city code because behind is a trash alley. And now the passion fruit is growing pretty well and it's even made its way over the wall. Let's go into the trash alley and I'll show you guys what it looks like on the trash alley side. Truthfully, when I planted this passion fruit vine, I didn't know if this microclimate would be good for this variety of edible vine. And it's proving to be very good. I can't wait for the first flowers. Oh, here's the first flower. Wow, this is the first flower this passion vine has ever produced. Amazing. And look at all the other flower buds ready to pop. Okay, so this is the year that this new passion fruit vine, which cost me $18, it's now starting to produce its fruit and so many people who are involved with my urban gardening and Arizona Facebook group have been posting about the price of fruits at the store 
that are unreasonably priced high. And people have been posting lately passion fruit that's been three, four dollars a piece. Well, I have found that passion fruit grows really well in Phoenix. The winter time knocks it back a little bit, but if you give it good mulch and a good microclimate, it'll grow great like this. So I'm hoping that my passion fruit vine will eventually take over the entire wall. And I just went out and purchased three, no, four more passion fruit vines so I can fill in these gaps. And so my entire wall eventually will be a green wall full of edible passion fruits. In my edible landscape, I'm really passionate about growing native trees and native bushes and cactus because I'm in the desert. And the nopales or the nopalitos or the prickly pear is one of my favorite edible cactus to grow. Not only are the pads edible, you can grill them on a barbecue like you would a portobello mushroom or sweet peppers. You can also use the prickly pear pads medicinally by kind of reducing them down into a clear gel that has healing properties. And there are several YouTube videos out there on how to do that. But when they fruit, when they flower and fruit, they produce a delicious fruit called a tuna or a tunas, las tunas. And they're really high in anti-inflammatories, great for athletes. So these three prickly pears in particular had the most delicious fruits I've ever come across. This one had purple fruits that were, no joke, they were this big around. This one back here had green fruits this big around, and the one in front of you guys had circular fruits, purple, the size of a softball. So what I did was about a year ago, I just sustainably harvested only one pad, one small pad from each of the parent cactus where I found these guys. And I brought one pad back to my home and I've grown all these extra pads from that original one in the last year and a half. So he's got his fourth generation of pads coming off and with any luck this year, I'll get fruits. And when I do, of course, I'll eat them and share them with you guys. I planted this neem tree also from Seamus O'Leary's about a year and a half ago. And even though this neem tree was a skinny little stick when I planted him, he was about as tall as me, but just a skinny stick. He took the monsoons very well and he survived the monsoons. I put him out here by himself because he does grow into a very big shade tree. And now he's starting to have all his beautiful growth for the springtime. And for the first time, if you can see on this branch and everywhere else, the neem is flowering, these beautiful purple flowers for the first time. I hope it shows up against my hand here. My hand's kind of dirty, but the purple flowers are so cute. And I know that neem has like hundreds of medicinal qualities and the neem can heal many diseases that are in your body. A lot of evidence out there, if you look it up for yourself, suggests that neem could be a cure for diabetes. So grow some neem and I wonder if anybody can comment down below if they know of any of neem's healing properties and can I use the flowers for anything? This is kind of a mini garden tour today with you and me. Lastly, I wanna show you guys all the borage that's been growing this year. I did not plant any of this borage. I first planted borage as little starts that I got from my friend Suzanne Velarde with VelardiGardens.com. Go to Velarde Gardens on Facebook to find her plants. And the borage I planted from Suzanne Velarde in previous years, seeded, and these are the babies that grew for free. So look at how abundant these cute little blue flowers are. And there's a few herb shops that I usually go to on Mill Avenue here in Tempe by Arizona State University. And they sell little, little baggies of borage. And they're pretty expensive, like 10 bucks for a little baggie. So I figure this is about a billion dollars worth of borage. <laughs> and I can harvest these flowers and turn them into a tea and use them to cleanse my body. If we keep walking this way, past my Thai basil, which is looking really good. You can see how this borage is a unique one because it has blue flowers, and in between the blue, it also has pink flowers. Oh, there's a bee right there. The bees frequent the flowers all day, and they never hurt you because they're all doped out and high off the pollen. So with any luck, I'll be able to have borage the rest of my life because it'll just seed itself, and that's the power of gardening is Initially, there's a cost to setting it up for infrastructure, but every season after that, you should be able to grow for almost free. Gardening is kind of like printing your own money. Not only that, but you're able to grow rare varieties of food that you can fuel your life with, and then you can pick it and eat it in its ripe state. Plus, you can choose what you put into your soil and therefore grow healthier food than the grocery store has for you. And next to me right here, 
This is the Pakistan female mulberry. Look at how long these guys are. They're almost like four or five inches long. And they'll get a little longer and twice as thick when they're ready to pick and they'll be purple, dark purple. And you guys know I'll come back to you here on the Vegan Athlete channel and I'll eat some in front of you when they're ready. Go vegan, grow your food at home. I love you guys, my fruit tree people out there, my tree people. If you guys wanna come meet me, I'll be at a lot of gardening events coming up because there's a lot of cool events in the Phoenix area happening and also in Los Angeles. I'm going to a few gardening events in Los Angeles. So hit me up on my Urban Gardening in Arizona Facebook group to find out where I'll be. And you can always message me on my Snapchat and Instagram at Jake Mace Tai Chi.